Welcome to the Jira Life, the place to find news, events, and interviews with the Atlassian community's movers and shakers. Join our hosts, Alex, Dr. Jira Ortiz, and Rodney, the Jira Guy Nissen, as well as the Jira Migos in the peanut gallery, as we sit down and discuss the latest going on in the Atlassian ecosystem. Because we didn't choose the Jira Life, the Jira Life chose us. Hey, yo. Hey, and we're back with Steve. Thank you for coming back. Thanks it's not very often that we get people to come back, huh? Ah, uh, you made a good impression, so here I am. <laughs> I'm glad uh, well, we'll see about next time. Yeah. We'll try harder. <laughs> you, you set the bar high here. Yep. So, so we have a lot of stuff planned for today. And as always, do. I never look at the script. So, Rodney? Take it away. <laughs> Lead us to. Well, before we begin with Stephen, um, we do want to get to your interview as soon as possible, but we do want to welcome the Jeremigos. I mean, I see Andy, I see Matt, I see Sean, um, otherwise known as the usual suspects. Um, are we, we going to do a little you, question and answer today? Are you um, proposing we change the name of the, the Jeremigos to the usual suspects? Can no, I just those three. Just I, those we three. Put, I was going to say, should we put some, like, ski masks on these? <laughs> I mean, if we give special ones for them, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Make sure you so find those. Amy Amy and Nina, hello. Um, so, Jeremy goes today. Why don't you tell us the one game or app on your phone you have been obsessed with over the past week? <laughs> Tetris? Have you been obsessed with Tetris, Alex? I've watched the Tetris movie and I became re obsessed. It was taking me right back to being five years old again. Nice. I won't say I how often good, I load I need up some the good, uh, uh, iPhone. I need some good iPhone uh, recommendations. I don't have any good ones these days. Uh, Alex is your man then. Mm, uh, yeah, um, Ronnie's anti good things in life. <laughs> <laughs> so they Let keep saying. For some reason. I just like to be able to hack my own stuff. I'm sorry. You too. See, Damien's on here, so he doesn't ever miss an episode. Matt Dorr just doesn't want to. He's too many games. You know, this whole wall here, everything there is just pure video games that I've probably never even played or beat. Wow. And there's, I mean, it goes on. <laughs> wow, look at that. It's two rows, too. Look at that. No comments. No comments. <laughs> I will say, video game does hit different once you see your own name in the credits. Do you it have does one? Hit different. Yeah, I've got a few that I appear in. Really? A Diablo 4 for one. Whoa. Oh, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Activision. <laughs> Where do they put you? What are you doing there, Jura Administrator, Diablo 4? <laughs> Actually, I think it's like enterprise application support, but basically, yes. There you go, friends. If you're a Jura admin for Activision, you too can make it into a hit <laughs> credit. That's a great also point. Several... Jira, Jira touches like every industry, right? Like pretty much not just anything. Jira. Confluence. Yeah, well, that's, right? Yeah, conflict, yeah confluence. Everything. So it's I like will tell you how many times like I stuck on the level. I'm like, well, let me just look at the dev notes and confluence because that's my system. Let's normalize. Giving your Jira admins, your Atlassian admins credits for your projects. Because SpaceX <laughs> couldn't get to the moon <laughs> without, right. without right. Jira. Right. <laughs> so, um, uh, Steve, I don't know if you know this, but one of the previous Jira admins at Carrier, he now works at SpaceX as a Jira admin at SpaceX. So, did not know that. Steve, if you're watching this, you should be getting credit here. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Right. That's your name on the inside of that rocket. <laughs> yeah, if we colonize the moon, you enabled that. 100 percent oh man i've been using Jira since 2016 not once i ever thought like heck had it not been for this these two hands here <laughs> we wouldn't have made it out there i mean my, it's still crazy when I, my name rolled up and i'm like that's me i had a hand in this just because i ran Jira and confluence rodney i have a i have a a superpower i like to take credit for other people's work I've so, heard you say that. 
This is this is one of the things I'm quite good at. If somebody on my team did a thing, you better believe I'm tagging my name onto it. It's a good team effort. It's a team, it's a team effort. If I'm part of it, but if I delivered it, it's a solo effort. So I had a teacher back in college. She said, "Don't put your name on it if you can't explain every single detail of it." So next time I'm in a meeting with you, I'm gonna grill you. That's zero percent. I've been very public about my lack of technical expertise. My other superpower is that I only hire people that are smarter than me. That's it. Like only people that are smarter than me and way more gifted than me. And and then I take credit for their work. It's basically like a <laughs> manager and leader ever. <laughs> Master delegator. <laughs> True. Yeah, I often think if if the world, if it all goes to the pot, you know, and like we're in a kind of last of us situation. I have no discernible skills. Like I'm just going to be the personality guy on the tribe who is told to watch a, a, a closet or something because the closet has medical supplies. I'm like, Steve, your job is to sit here and don't let anyone in that closet. Like that's it. And anytime we come by, I, I like, hopefully I can make them laugh or something. Like that's it. I can't do anything else. I'm going to have to share a picture with you. Um, I was on a little world tour, or at least a little West Coast tour with uh, um, Mark Cruz uh, two, almost two months ago now. And he's got this little picture. We we used it in one of our team meetings. And it's a boat. It's a pirate ship. And there's various people in the pirate ship, whether they're in the water or spread out throughout the ship. They each have a number. And it was a pretty cool building exercise where you're like, which number best represents you and your role in your team? And like just hearing everybody's like responses of like, I'm the anchor or I'm the lookout or I'm the pirate or I'm the captain or whatever. It was like it was so interesting to see everybody's justification. I'll have to send it to you. You should have to try it in the in your team. Yeah, that's right, Sean. I can I can make sandwiches. <laughs> that could be my my, my Wait, thing. Someone has to make sandwiches. That's right. I can I be. You know what I would be good at is if if this was a poke a post apocalypse society, I would be a really good barkeep. Like that's it. That's all I can do. And like I would I would distribute like the limited booze to the to the survivors, and I would find creative ways to eat like dried meats. From and the play death. a little hitch to reproduce yeah. society again. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Put them back on track. Look at that. So, Mr. because Andy kept bringing it up, yes, there I am. Subtle flex. Well done. <laughs> the third. Dang, Ronnie. Well yep. done. I went to differentiate myself from Junior. <laughs> <clears throat> um, Because I know my wife is watching, and I need to make an announcement to her. The contractor's coming. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Uh, just needed to make that announcement real quick. <laughs> okay, Ronnie, what's next on the agenda? Well, I mean, um, next on the agenda really is Stephen. Um, glad to have you back. Um, we got a Some number of topics time. here to ask you about. This time, Stephen, you don't have to share the spotlight with anyone. So no, as, to that. as a narcissist, I'm grateful for the extra spotlight. So thank you. Oh, you handled it so well last time. <laughs> Did I turn off? Um, the, is it really that dark in here? <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit dark. You guys, man. It's like a thousand <laughs> degrees in my room already. And I guess I will. I think they're more talking about the lights behind you. They like watching the patterns. <laughs> there. Now what, we have a have disco. That automated? <laughs> we'll have so a disco cool. going. <laughs> okay. Back to our guest of honor here. What is the first question we're going to kick off well, with? Well, the first topic we have here is Stephen, what is your opinion on say do ratios? All right. So, uh, a little bit of a hot take here. So, uh, a little bit about my role. So, you know, I, I, uh, 
build software. I oversee software builds uh, for a, a large industrial company, and uh, primarily in the the com global commerce and martech uh, spaces. So uh, typically leveraging out of the box SaaS solutions, but at an enterprise level. Um, so you know, as far as like development teams go, you know, we may have. 60, 70 people kind of working in a, a variety of pods. So pods being eight to 10 people. And uh, there's this movement at my organization to track uh, say do ratios, which is not uncommon among uh, enterprise development teams. So here's my question for the pod. This is, this is my little bit of a hot take. And I have, I have a little bit of bravado in this topic. So I, I beg a little bit of latitude. But my question is this, are say-do ratios actually helpful? Is it actually something that we want to have in place for high-performing teams? Or is it something that we put in place for, um, I'll say, more junior resources to keep, um, to monitor, to make sure that they are, um, staying in line at the right level. Yeah. I, first of all, before we answer that question, if Robert, if you have time, I'd love to bring you onto this conversation. I think Robert needs to be on this conversation. <laughs> Mainly because he's our. He's also the one antagonizing that we um, Eli five it. So. <laughs> but so but I guess let's define our terms. Yeah, While so, we're waiting for Robert, let's define our terms. So what I hear say, right, um, say to me is like the commitment that you're making at the beginning when you draw that line in the sand. And the do mm -hmm. is X amount of time passes, how far or close or were we to that line? Correct. So practically right. speaking, when we do our sprint planning, you, you know, determine how many stories and how many points are associated with the stories. And then you make a commitment to say, I, as a team, I'm going to commit to these many stories and these many points in a given sprint, two weeks, three weeks, a month, whatever that sprint looks like. Uh, let's take a classic two week sprint, right? And then you are measured at the end of that sprint based upon what you were able to complete. How many stories did you complete? How many stories did you close? How many points were able to be completed? And what you uh, committed to at the beginning of the sprint and then what you completed what you committed to is your say and what you completed is your do. And so then you are measured at what's called a say do ratio or essentially right? what were you able to commit to? What were you able to complete based on your commitments? And as a percentage, what is your say do ratio? Do you do I've heard it? I've heard, heard it described as predictability. So, um, you know, basically what committed versus actual, uh, yeah. type of thing is usually a, a measure of predictability. And the problem that I see is you're, you're kind of reverting more to measuring outputs versus measuring outcomes. Correct. And how much, yeah. y y you know, yay, you, you completed 30 story points worth of work. Great. How much of that really benefited the customer or the end user. I agree 100%. Uh, when I worked at a large aerospace company, um, we bid our contracts on strictly story points. So at the end of the contract, we couldn't bill beyond the story points that we had already accounted for, right? So all, <laughs> <that might happen. laughs> all the numbers, all the numbers at the end of the day, they were arbitrary, right? Because they just had to align. And, and what I've seen happen a lot, right, is that we get these teams that are like, okay, we're on the hook for 30. We're going to give you 30 points worth of work. You're just not going to take on any hard ones, <laughs> right? Like you get like the low hanging fruit. You get you get the non-value added stuff because you're being graded, right? It, it's, I think, in my opinion, it, it turns it into a vanity metric. It turns it into a target that the team just needs to hit to not get fired or not get into so, trouble. Yeah, right? it's, it, you know, it, it, it'll, it'll definitely... If it, if it gets emphasized, people are going to look to completing that as opposed to seeing if there's any value in what, in what they deliver. Yeah, so the way, 
the way I think about it is I have a very, so there's like, I understand, I think I understand the school of thought. And if I understand the school of thought, I don't necessarily agree with it. But I think, I think predictability is probably the best synthesis of what the metric is trying to accomplish. Oh, yeah. But I also think that it also is an accountability metric for resources to essentially say like you're, you're accountable to what you scope and what you commit to. So, so on one end, and like on a macro level, it's like predictability. I think like on a micro level, it's like an accountability thing. So at a macro level, I could look at a department and say the predictability of this department is 90% because their say do ratio is 90%. And then I could go on a micro level and say like, well, these devs are, or these, these resources within the pod, like some of them hit their commitments, some of them don't. And then that becomes a discussion is like, okay, do we have a, tr a training issue where we need to train someone because they're not trained? Do we have like an engagement issue? Someone's being lazy. Is it, are we? I don't think it's neither. I don't think it's any of those. I think it's a, I think it's a motivation problem. Right. And you said oh, something that. I, well, I can tell you what the problem is. I, I'm just talking about what's the positives for this. Like, oh. how. Uh, okay. <laughs> you want to get after, like, my thoughts. My thoughts are I think that it incentivizes. I actually believe it incentivizes bad behavior, personally. So, what it does is metrics are meant to drive behavior, right? Yes. If you set it a certain KPI or metric, you're essentially making a statement that by hook or by crook, we have to get to this place. And it's your job as a professional to get to that place. So if I say the say-do ratio needs to be 90% and there's no metric around quality, it's just around quantity, well, then you sure as shit, I'm going to scope out. I'm going to say my commitments are always 60% of my yeah. capacity, right? 60% of my capacity, so I'm always going to pad that, like 100%. At that, at that aerospace company, we had a saying, better, faster, cheaper. You pick two. You can't have all three. Yeah, 100%. Right? <laughs> you can't 100%. have all three. But if I'm if I'm putting these are if I'm putting public metrics around that, then it becomes I'm asking the question: Are we actually driving a high like? Are we creating a culture of high potentials, like high pose, high quality resources and and humans performing at the highest level, building the best quality solutions that get the best outcomes? Like that's in my mind. If I'm building and running a department or a team, an organization, that's that's where my focus would be. There, there may be some indicators. Like I could see say do like is something that's tracked as a as an indicator, but maybe not as like an important KPI or a measurable thing where people's performances are gauged off of. Yeah. You make it you make it a you make it a KPI, people are gonna start gaming it. That's what I see historically. It, right. it becomes a game, right? It becomes like a do enough work to stay under the radar, but not so much work that you're over the radar. <laughs> right. You know, and then right. and then there might be some things like pointflation that kind of come into it. But also, like, where's the where's the risk taking? You know what I mean? Like, where's the rewarding of like the entrepreneurial spirit to say, like, I'm going to try this thing. And if I can't get to it, there's no repercussion to it right like i trust my people enough to say like the most hard and complex and nuanced problems are the ones that i want my pod working on and i they're going i have confidence they're going to perform at, at the highest level and i'm not sure a say do ratio is indicative of that that kind of team to perform but no. but the, you're describing a high performance team versus like a a team i have always felt of the opinion that if you need metrics then you're not doing it right. Because a high-performance team, right, a group of individuals that have come together to, to rally behind a mission and really build something that they care about, they're going to mm -hmm. do it night or day. What did you say, crook or hook? Yeah, by crook, <laughs> by crook or by hook. Yeah, okay. but for the right reasons, right? They're going to do what they need to do, pull the all-nighters that they need to. Like, I think Elon Musk kind of, and, and like the whole Twitter thing and the whole like SpaceX thing, like it really embodies that you buy into your leader so strongly, you latch onto them. That you're almost afraid to let them down and you do whatever it takes to get there and you know metric is going to help you convey that loyalty that accountability yeah. and that mission ability but, to a to a leader 
But let's be real. How many leaders are actually able to inspire that kind of, for <laughs> lack of a better word, fanaticism? Yeah. Very few. You you have three. Job. Yeah, and I think that my, jobs, I may say, might be one. I question whether Musk is one. I really have questions about him. <laughs> I think two things can exist at the same time. I think that a leader can in inspire this level of fanaticism or discipleship or whatever you want to call it. I I'm totally on board with that. I think that I, I don't have a problem with KPIs as a mechanism by which we drive behavior. I think that's like you can have KPIs that uh, promote the right actions, promote the right behaviors and generate the right business value. I just think that we have to be extremely thoughtful and intentional around associations of those KPIs and understanding what behaviors we are inherently going to incentivize. By oh, establishing. absolutely. Yeah. yeah that, you're going to play that, a thing. I think that's the only thing I'm saying. And I'm, I'm drawing a line to say if say do ratios are a high level KPI, I actually think it is creating a problem that is unintended. I think it's creating an unintended problem that's actually worse than the value that you would get from the KPI itself. 100% because you play it so safe, right? Yeah. I think you said earlier, there's no, you're not, you're not really going to take any risks here. You just want to make sure that you're almost like a manufacturing worker, right? You're, you're trying to right. just hit your quota. You're disincentivizing. I think you disincentivize high potential in, like team members. That's but like, but I will tell you for high performance teams or, or for cognitive workers, I'll just generalize it, right? You have to be very careful because, again, I worked in this defense industry full of rules. Like, I, we had a PowerPoint that was like the size of a book and just pure reports and metrics that we would go through daily. So I got, I gave up with that life and I'm like, let me go to a startup. Let me go to a 300 person startup. Zero metrics. <laughs> they're like, what? The, they're like, what's the story point? <laughs> they're like, they didn't care about any of that. And I saw anarchy, like total chaos. When you have zero rules as well, when you have no measure, nobody gets anything done because you. I the best analogy I can get is that you get a group of people, really, really, really smart people, and everybody disperses, but they're all tied by with a rope at the hip, and they all just fall down because you get nothing yeah. done. Everybody just goes and wanders. So I'll give you a very classic uh, example that I have seen in my career. Uh, very classically, when you think of KPIs or metrics, you think about, like, let's just take very general, uh, applicable to any industry. You have sales and marketing, right? Sales mm -hmm. and marketing both need each other to be successful. When you have a team that is incentivized for uh, sales, like we'll call it, yeah, let's say, let's say, uh, you've got people that are responsible for marketing qualified leads, and then you've got sales closing, right? So you've got an organization, you've got a team or a department that's responsible for feeding a pipeline of leads to a sales team. And then you've got a sales team who's responsible for closing those leads and actually generating sales, right? So you got two, and both of those organizations are dependent on one another to be successful, but both of them have KPIs that are oftentimes distinct from one another. So what you have, which is very, very classic, is the sales team freaking hates the marketing team. The sales team hates the marketing team because the marketing team, all they care about is leads. They don't care where the leads came from, the quality of those leads. They just have to hit numbers. I need a thousand leads every month by hook or by crook. I'm getting my thousand leads. I don't care, right? So that drives behavior, that drives how they go at it, where they're fishing in their ponds for marketing, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then sales, all they got to do is close, right? So then you're in this posture where it's like sales and sales money is the oxygen that a company needs to breathe, right? So there is like some truth to that. Well, there is 100% truth to that, but the sales team has to close deals. They have to generate revenue. So when you have a sales team that's not supported by a marketing team in the way that they need to be better at sales, you have salespeople that are constantly looking to, to close and you have these very aggressive end of cycle deals that are just going to erode margins and erode profits, right? Because these salespeople just have to close deals 
by hook or by crook. It doesn't matter. They have to close these deals. So therefore, you have this organization that's growing maybe on a top line, but it's not growing on a on the below the line. The profitability is not growing. Organizations that have been the most profitable, especially in the tech space, if you look at HubSpot's a great example. They have what are called marketing goals. They have sales and marketing goals that are tied to one another. Yeah. They have marketing teams that are tied to qualified leads, not just number of leads. That so those quality of leads actually has to be at a certain like measurement so that those sales teams can then close. And then it, what they found is that the closing rates and the profitability, the deal and the wallet size go higher, higher, and higher because the quality from the top of the funnel comes down. And then There's... what they actually have is like a shared metric so that if sales closes the deal marketing gets a cut of their commission as a result there's so, actually other combined um sales and marketing uh metrics models um the the best example i can think of are um pirate metrics mm. you know where not only is it acquisition but it's also retention and oh yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right so so yeah but, that's that's something that would affect so okay so to bring it back to to like like agile and jira i think that we have to find at least in my experience i have to find a better way to talk to tie the quality of the work that the devs that, that our development teams are working on with actual business outputs but what an that be then what the sprinkle and all that mentality is behind yeah, so the, so what I'm what I'm advocating for is more of an empowerment of the product managers and the product owners to be held accountable to be, to be given autonomy to make better agile decisions because they're accountable to business goals rather than like building software in a vacuum. Like when when technical teams are building without business context, that's where you end up with shelfware yeah. and i think that we i think that i am a fierce advocate of tpms and po's being given autonomy because if you have the right person in that role you will build remarkable products but those tpms and po's have to be tied to things like product marketing managers customer advocates customer service sales like they have to be like hand in glove with the folks that are on the front line of the business and i think the way that you bring in development on there really depends on what your definition of done is is Correct. the definition of done is it is it um it gets um it gets merged into uh the higher level branch and you know the the team doesn't uh think about it ever again unless something wrong happens and there's an outage right. or like I is have, it it's actually out there in the field being used by uh yeah. customers but I think a market. lot of the core problem though that I think a lot of teams and companies that are using like Jira still what they what I've seen so much happen is that they take a waterfall model and they mm -hmm. slice it into sprints and all of a sudden we're agile yeah right Right. I mean, I remember seeing this comic about <laughs> job descriptions. Never, and, uh, yeah, it's got it's basically the job description said we're agile, and it said what we really mean is we have a daily stand up. <laughs> yeah. what, they, what they want is Steve, go build a process by which you tell me exactly in what order everything is gonna be built over a year long process and then break it up into two sprints. And by the way, <laughs> by the way, that, that has been like the hardest point. Like it is so hard to grasp, right? Like I think that's where agile breaks the most, right? Is where like mm -hmm. it is agile doesn't I, I think where agile fails a lot and where it doesn't do a good job is giving these people the, the purse holder, right? The, the person that owns the money. Because I can I can empathize, right? If if I had them if if you were playing with a hundred million dollars of mine, I'd want to know every penny. Okay, okay, okay. So this is interesting. I think you mitigate it by, um, I think you mitigate it by taking an agile approach to the financial process, 
So by that, I kill people. <laughs> I, I mean that is serious. I mean that you you basically you basically take all like a hundred million dollars, right? Let's take your example, hundred million dollars, hundred million bucks, and you put it into escrow, and then you say as the development team is moving forward in certain toll gates throughout the project, we are able again. I'm giving TPMs and POs full autonomy to build according to business value and the funding flows accordingly. Like I, I, and, and you incentivize TPOs to not only build on time and on budget, but early and under budget. But, and but now that starts, that starts that? looking a lot, hold up, hold up. That starts looking a whole lot like the way Silicon Valley funding works, where you'll get your initial seed money, right. but you, you're, you're not given the full half a million. You're giving like fifty thousand dollars to do a POC, which I'm okay with. Getting a lot, right? And I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I think it eases the risk from the person who's the VC or the fund, etc. But what it does, again, I think that having a TPM fully autonomous to make these, like a TPM and a a PO for me, are kind of like mini CEO or COOs, really. And then they go through and they make deci- they make strategic decisions to take on certain things that are in part of a larger plan and strategy. And I, I'm very bullish with the idea of technical resources being tied to business outcomes. So if I any developer on a pod, I should be able to ask them. Can you draw a straight line between the work that you're doing right now and the impact it's going to have on the business? Most people Maybe can. say it another way. Can you have a developer, any developer, articulate what the business actually but, does? Or so when I train my teams, does? when I train my teams, we're working at the story level, right? I have my teams tie those stories to epics, right? Okay. I'm, yeah. And then those epics, I got them tied to those initiatives, which are now at the initial level. Now we're talking business. Right. So that works, provided that at the initiative level, you have a business case, a user flow. But you um, should if you're do if you're there. Like if you're not, then what are you doing? Well, don't make me answer that. That's the question. But, <laughs> don't make me answer that. But uh, yeah, I, I agree. Like it, a customer, like dev should be able to to be able to articulate a customer persona. Just like a sales director should be able you know, to. Yeah, I need to get you in a room with Mark Brickley. He, I don't know who that is, but he sounds cool. He, <laughs> he's, a, um, <laughs> he's a software engineer. He, uh, he's been on the, he was on our 24 hour live stream, but he makes an app for the um, Atlassian ecosystem. Um, but he's also like a, they're a dev shop, so they make custom software for companies. But him and I were talking about what exactly is a story, right? Because we're talking about like, I have a specific distinct way of writing stories, which is not aligned with the way Agile defines the user stories. So you don't use the, uh, you don't use the, I don't use the persona stuff. No, no. But, but Mark kind of convinced me to look at it from that perspective because Mark and I had this disagreement. We had this argument last week where like, what comes first, design or engineering? Design. Why? And what do you design off of? You design off of an idea of an whose idea? You design off of a comp. So essentially, like the company it, it, it has all to user have stories a- for a reason. There's a user story, right? So he's like the user story drives the design, which then drives the oh. task. No, 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 because the initiative drives the epics, which drives the story. Yes, but at the end of the day, we got to build something functional. And, and what that's does it look like? But it can't happen without design. You don't build a website thinking about the tech first. You build a website with the design first and then the underlying tech to execute on it. That's true because you leave it to you you leave it to the implementers of the user story to uh, figure out the how. You, exactly. uh, you a good user story does not tell you how it tells you what should happen oh i agree or, with that uh, from from the that. point of uh the user of your website or the I user agree with of, that. 
of and I the, and again the going back to the autonomy of the TPM and the PO, it is their call on how to execute. Like mm -hmm. here's the user story. If your you it's your professional responsibility to execute on that according to a broader plan that you have been brought into. But, I'm not here. But here's kind of where I have a problem though. So I agree with what you guys are saying. We we come up with a good design. We have a user story that describes what needs to be done. Then the engineer goes and figures out how to build it. What happens when the design was garbage? You iterate. You iterate. But you, you don't because most people lock their designs. Right? We're back into this waterfall method in the in an agile world. In a in a in a uh, in a rigid team, I would agree with you. But it should it should be like in a say do team. In a say do, well, you know what's interesting? In a say do team, I would argue that you would get a lower quality product in a say do team, like lower quality results. If it's a product, you know we're getting a lower quality product because the say do team is going to have less to. I think say do doesn't incentivize a pod to perform at its fullest capacity or to challenge status quo or to challenge status quo because Absolutely. it's going to hurt the metric it, it's going to drive exactly. them to uh more exactly. on um you know completing what we committed to exactly and, and that may that may mean you know especially on the couple of days before the end of the sprint that may mean just do whatever to get it get it across close everything right get it out close on, it, a, get it. on a similar but related note should stories have start and end dates well i thought the story start and end date was the sprint yeah it's the sprint it is but that i'm asking in a, in a they do team steve <laughs> what are your thoughts well, on that well here's the thing right is they're gonna my opinion is that i don't necessarily care about the rate of a burn down because like closing a story with a date is going to show like in theory you can look at a you can look at a sprint and say we are 70 percent through it or whatever right and i can start to see the burn down how many stories i have and, and blah, blah blah right but i also like i don't i as a man like as a manager of that team i shouldn't care what that burn down looks like i should just care that it got closed but then by that metric though you shouldn't care what a say do ratio is but this is part of my thing right is i'm saying that like i i shouldn't care what the say do ratio is i should care about the quality and the deliverable but how do you measure that how, who isn't beauty in the eye of the beholder or do we just need better requirements well so there's, you know, that's, that's that's what uh that's what a sprint review is for exactly right the, the right, person that check, determines right? the quality of the uh, of what you implemented, it's not the team. It's it's it's, right? it's, it's not a TDD uh, test. It's it, it, you know uh, it could you know a BDD test might come close, but really the final arbiter is the user. It's the customer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. But they're usually looped in so late into the game, even in an agile world. It's not supposed to be. They're not supposed to be. Everybody, everybody they're, they're supposed, you're supposed to be hand holding right. with them. Right. Well, otherwise, you're 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 doing agile. Yeah, because I think <laughs> Alex like Waterfall. I think Waterfall. that's agile is really good. I'm gonna steal that. That's really good. Uh, I think that like if so, you should be able to. It, like I think it's reasonable, and this is where you probably should push back against me. I do think it's reasonable to say, I need this piece of functionality built. And I need it built in three months. I think it's reasonable to say there's a period of time in order for business to function. I have to have some broad understanding of how long and what it costs. Yeah, might be. So it goes back to that hundred million dollars, right? That that owner needs to have some fuzzy feeling of like right. something, when right? Get done. I'm giving you a hundred million. But getting there is kind of that is on the debt, like that is on the agile. Team. Like if we truly believe in autonomous like self-sustaining teams, you have to empower, empower your people in order to make proper informed business decisions and then hold them accountable. I do well, agree with accountability. They also need to have skin yeah. in the game. The the resources within the pod yeah, you're saying? They just can't be an, uh, like a third-party team that you just outsource the, the coding efforts to because 
When is it no crazy? Is it crazy to say this is this is real provocative? So hear me out. Is it crazy to say that we should build comp packages for technical resources the same a similar way that we build comp packages for sales associates? Wasn't that what Silicon Valley does? Most of your salary is tied to stock, so you're incentivized to perform and do well so that your net worth goes up? No, I, I mean work product. Like, if, yeah, yes to that. Yeah, yes to, like, uh, like stock and sharing ownership, all of that. I'm, I'm, I'm so in on that. I'm saying hot take in a way where you compensate sales folks to say you've got a base salary, you have an on target earnings, and then you have a commission that's capped or uncapped. And that's it. That's what we, and so we incentivize these killers to go out and make a shit ton of money. But you got to be but, careful with that, right? Because it, it has to be a similar metric to your sales team where it's like, you don't judge them based on, can I make a hundred thousand calls in a month? Right. But rather, can I bring in $100,000 of earnings? Right. And what if what if we had metrics set up for our IT teams based on the quality of their deliveries to say, in a year, if we hit this many releases with this sort of metric, then there's actually like, it's financially compensated accordingly. Um, I, I would caution against releases. But yeah, then, sure. But yeah, everything can be everything can become uh, militarized. Like it's, it's all against you. I haven't seen a clever way of solving this problem. Right. If and, you put and, if you put in a comp package that that was super aggressive with the team, and said we've got this product that we have to bring to market. Let's say I'm behind. I'm Elon Musk, and it's a race to Mars. It's me versus the Russians. I've got to get there. Right. But we did that in 1969. What, but the last time America church, innovated. I would, I would go out and get the brightest minds in the world and say, if we can get our people to a moon, a, a moon of Mars in six months, like here's here's the bonus. If you can get to Mars by nine months, here's the bonus. Like whatever, there would be some. I would tie that team to business results. So I'm going to tell you that right now you're you're uh, th and this may be tangential. You're you're looking at one of the shortcomings that many organizations have with um, agile adoption, and that is from an HR standpoint because HR is really really tied to individuals and not teams. Correct. Hiring, compensation, the the, the whole deal is tied to getting superstar individuals and not being able to create superstar teams. It's not crazy. It's not, I'm not the first person to think that you can have, you could even do it at the pod level. Like think about, think about if you had it's something. Like the tiger team. Yeah. Yeah. But, but what if so we had a team? But if you, yeah, but a mixed resource team that was responsible for getting after something. But and I've seen it, it. It is possible. When I was at, again, my big last defense contractor, we were three years behind schedule yeah. on this major deliverable. This director, she came in from a black program. And uh, she, her, I still remember this so well. Her first week there, she went and just listened in on everybody's meetings. She got invited to all the meetings. And then day by day, she gave pink slips, pink slips to every lead. And in their spot, she popped in a person that would take a bullet for her. But she had a trusted software engineer manager, a trusted tester, a trusted systems engineer, a trusted designer, right? Any, uh, this entire, like, she was like Robert De Niro and Meet the Fockers, right? Like, she had this circle of trust where nobody would dare challenge her in a way that would be against her. But they would all take bullets for her. And this team of eight people did the entire program that had 200 people on it. Because you didn't need everybody else. You just needed those core eight people that worked together to fix the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I even asked them, like, what's the point of hiring everybody else? And we're like, we just need butts and seats at this point <laughs> for the contract. <laughs> but, yeah, right. it, 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 there is power in just having 
a key group of high performance individuals that work well together, trust each other, and know how to deliver on a mission. Yeah. And then well, we... it is my job to be that person yet again. <laughs> <laughs> really in the conversation. Every time we're all a great producer. <laughs> what I'm actually doing is guaranteeing Steve will have to come back again to continue this conversation. I'm here. I'm here for the hot takes. So, <laughs> Don Doyle said there's someone from the State Department that wants oh, to talk I'm, to you about your hiring practices. I've See, got I at think least a happen. dozen points where I'm like, "That's a short. That's a short. That's a short." <laughs> See, what's going to have to happen is we're just you're just going to have to join us on the Jira Life as we're now. I don't know, Ronnie. Are we ready to announce this? But we hit a thousand subscribers recently. Yeah. So we are that much closer to turning this into a real business. Which How many got to get to? Much, sorry. How many we have to get to for real business? Well, what, we, what do you monetize? we need 1,500 watch hours. So somebody just got to watch all the Jira Life on loop the whole day. <laughs> One, two, three, not it. Uh, nope. What are you talking about? The four of us need to be watching this on replay <laughs> all day. <laughs> right? We just need the 1,500 hours. But the, the announcement we're trying to make, right, was we're very close to basically figuring out we need to establish the Jira Life as a real company. Right? Because yeah. money's going to start flowing in here. And um, might be time to start taking over the world, Steve. <laughs> Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. This is fun, guys. You guys really have a, a nice little thing going here. It's it's it it's a creative outlet. <laughs> yep. We try. Although Bob, you still sound like you're underwater. He <laughs> doesn't sound like that to me. I think that may be you. No, it sounds weird. Okay. Anyways, bring us back in, Ronnie. We got 15 minutes. All right. Well, um, Alex kind of spoiled it, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> this past Monday, or was it Tuesday? Yeah. Tuesday yeah, during the live stream. We caught it. We caught it during the live yeah, stream. Yeah, we caught it. Alex was doing a live stream for um the um the live uh, learning for Atlassian. Atlassian. Yeah, the live learning from Atlassian. Um, I was on the backstage doing um producer work, keeping track of questions, all that, and we hit a thousand in the middle of the stream. I was literally in the middle of typing, we have one more left, and then that one more clicked. Yeah, I refreshed real quick and I was like 1000. I was like, "Oh my gosh, we did it again." <laughs> we've caught we've caught the 1000 from my channel, we've caught the 10,000 from my channel, and now we caught the 1000 for the Jira life. So we're going to catch the 10,000 live, right? <laughs> <laughs> Even if we have to do a 24-hour live stream. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to do 12 hours. Yeah. I'll conveniently be on vacation. <laughs> But you're the most but, important part of those streams. Ronnie, did you hear I got in trouble today from uh, with the last game? I did not. They, I, Lauren called me out. <laughs> What'd you yeah. do this time? Well, because I I posted that I'm I'm still sad that I'm not a community leader. And and I miss out on some exciting benefits that community leaders have that I just simply don't have. And um it's been a, it's been a wild ride. It's been a very emotional ride. At least, at least, I, I did thank Lauren because we have a lot of the benefits that the community leaders get. Now the content creators, which is what I am, I'm a creator. We get a lot of the same benefits. But yeah, it it, it was it's been a struggle. What are some of the key like differences? So actually, what are the per walk me through it? What are just the perks in general? So community leaders in Alaskan is like. A, a really cool program that both Rodney and Bob are, and I'm not a part of. <laughs> so they can give you more. I don't but, know how I'm, um, but I'm going to run with we're, it. We're all flabbergasted, as, as was the internet with my post. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like last year, so I'll give you great examples. Last year, um, the they get to come in to that last year conference that's happening here at the end of the month. They get to come in like the day before or something like that and like go through special sessions that are just for yeah. them. They get to have dinner with the executive team at Atlassian. Nice. And there's like an award ceremony and stuff, right? They get um, all the certifications for free, right? Something like that. And something like that. Something like that. They get they get um, they get a uh, free okay. Jira, so the access to all the products for for free. That's not um, true. Well, uh, all right, that is kind of true. 
I mean, you gave me one, so. <laughs> oh. But the insult, the, the one that, that upset me the most is the Jira Live is officially hosted through the their special platform that they have for events. So as members of the Elastic community, you can sign up through uh, A-stock com- A-stock A-stock.com. Yeah, A-stock.com, yes. and you can sign up and actually register to attend the Jira Live, right? And then I, I'm, I'm told there's like points or credits or something that are given to people. And this tool here, the, the ability to create these events and edit the times and the thumbnails and whatnot, you need to be a community leader to, to have access to this. Uh, so I can't edit my own events. <laughs> actually, you need to be, uh, even if you're a community leader, uh, you, may, you don't have access to edit willy-nilly the events like um i, like, I, I can't go in line Phoenix. i can't edit the atlanta events even if i want to but yeah but that's the part that made me the most mad because i have the ability to edit my ace the live learning ones that i do in bevy and it was just like i told the lady I was like, if i already have the ability to edit mine why can't i edit the jira lives and she's like because you're not a leader and i'm like name one person that does more for this damn community <laughs> <laughs> Apparently the jury guy. Uh, I think I'm later. Later. That so would be the ultimate. This, this is the post that kind of went crazy, but just to give you some insight, um, I don't know how many views I've gotten on that one, but let me yeah, find it. You got it's getting fair numbers from what I could see though. A, a thousand impressions. The the post that you were flashing up earlier, the one about um the I'm opening up my channel to guest speakers, whoever wants to do the presentation. That one's gotten like 13,000 views on it. Hey, as it should, and I was going to get it a few more. Um, <laughs> guys, I know when it comes to Team 24, a lot of us put in proposals. The acceptance rate is like maybe 10%, probably closer to 8 or 9 Not Most people got rejected from these um putting in these talks so 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 putting it this way you have a better chance of uh getting accepted at harvard than of getting your talk accepted yeah very good way to put it so um there's been this joke within the community leaders that um we need some sort of rebel movement to just hey these are good talks we're just going to do them on our own Apparently, um, Alex is thinking the same thing here. If you have a talk you submitted for Team 24 and it did not get accepted, reach out to this man. 18,622 impressions. Let's go. On this post, so. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. I'm figuring out the virality of LinkedIn. I mean, I've been sharing it on, like, everything, so. Yeah. But, yeah, open invitation to anybody here if anybody wants to uh... – you know, give your talk. My channel's got more than enough room for you. I um maybe taking advantage of that. Do you want me just to rant on something for like forty five minutes? We you can jump on, yes. on if you ever want to come on my main channel and you're not afraid of a hundred thousand people seeing you. <laughs> just go. Oh, remember when I told you I'm a narcissist? I love when people see me. Yeah, well then let's do it. Yeah. Whenever you want to schedule something, I'll put something on your calendar. You just gotta tell me what. It, like, what do I got to talk? What do you need me to rant on? Whatever you want. This is really for you to. So is this what it how is? about mixed PODs, mixed pods, incentivizing um, agile behavior when you have both internal and external pods? Oh, my gosh. Are you giving me a, a forum to yes. just go after the Deloitte's and the EYs and the Accenture <laughs> of the world? Yes. I don't know if you want. I'm doing it know. on behalf of Alex. I don't know. <laughs> I want to want. hear that conversation. I don't know if you want that smoke, guys. <laughs> it's on Alex's it's... channel, so I don't care. I know, right? <laughs> Whatever doesn't get you fired, Steve. <laughs> oh, no. It would be getting you fired. <laughs> I signed a waiver. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love I love uh, EY, Deloitte, and Accenture. They're great. Uh, did I tell you, Steve? So I, I, I guess I can talk about it now, especially since we only have a few minutes. But um, at January third, Ethics called me up. Oh wow! Congratulations. Yeah, they're <laughs> like, they're like, what's this YouTube business you got going on? <laughs> oh my! So they found you. They, they found, found me mainly because I had a LinkedIn post that went viral and had like one hundred fifty thousand views or something on it. What? Yeah. Yes, so, they, yes, you did. so, so Carrier thought I was working for Atlassian. 
Oh, they thought you had a yeah. Yeah, you. that I was double dipping here with that last one, so I had to sign a new um, ethics agreement <laughs> that discloses my extracurricular activities. Oh yeah, if like uh, if you have any sort of like side business, I think you have to do that. Yeah, so I'll, I'm all squared away. So. I'm good. Congratulations. It's a scary process to go through. Yeah, especially when ethics and legal jump on a call. <laughs> especially when I had I had like 50 grand on the line and in fine print it says pending no le legal or ethic violations. <laughs> oh my <goodness. laughs> No, they go oh boy. <laughs> I'm glad you made it through unscathed though. I I have had to talk to the ethics and uh, legal representatives at Carrier for other different things, and they are very nice people. But I've always been like, you kind, you guys are kind of like the dentists. Like every time I go to the dentist, I always say like, "Thank you for cleaning my teeth. I need you to know up front, I hate everything you stand for and who you are as a profession." But with that said, I understand that you're here to help me. I just can't stand your profession. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of how I feel about these people. They're lovely people, very kind, very professional, very good at their job. I just, as a profession, ethics and legal teams are very difficult to work with. But they and now HR, people. add HR to your list because they, they're the ones that are preventing us. There are some people on the carrier HR team who are redeeming my understanding of HR. Shout out to <laughs> Tariq. <laughs> All right, um, everybody. We got five, five minutes, minutes left. Quiz that time. So we need like a yep. drum roll or suspense. We do need a sound effect for that. Yeah. That's, I guess that's my actual time. Um, but no, um, Steve, something new we're doing here with our guests is something called the quick quizlet. We're going to give you five questions. Um, they're either going to be A or B um, format, choose A or B really fast, okay. um, or they're going to be fill in the blank. Um, you have to answer them as fast as possible, but after each question, you can explain your answer if you want to. Okay. And we'd love to hear the explanations, so it's not. Yeah. Do, I, do I explain them immediately, or I get through I'll, all the questions I'll, and then I'll call you out well, you know, after after each one. Give give a give an explanation. We can kind okay. of yeah. We can kind of uh, noodle on that. Okay. Yep. Okay. I'm ready. So first one is the softball. They get harder after that. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Coffee. Why? Uh, he, in the words of Ted Lasso, is just bad tasting water. Oh my gosh, yeah, totally. I hot don't leaf know. Juice. Let's call it hot leaf juice. Hot leaf juice, that's good. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, um, next one closed or done? What is the final status of an issue? Done, 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 <laughs> done, done, done makes done? me feel done, makes me feel better. He's like, I, no, feel emotion, I feel emotionally safe if you say something's done. If you say closed, I still have anxiety that it's not completed. Okay, which is the better rich billionaire philanthropist superhero? Iron Man or Batman? Iron Man. He's funnier. Not Batman? Batman's too, Batman's too brooding. Iron Man's and funnier. Some, I mean, unless he's Adam West. Uh, it's a good point. Batman is still charming. I like. I didn't say I didn't like a good brooding Christian Bale type character, Robert Patterson. Um, you like Robert Adam. Patterson, really? I, bro, a I, really good Batman movie. There's a wow, space, the whole time. All I was thinking about was the, the brooding character. Okay, in the one with one minute, my favorite genre is anytime there is a character who has had some sort of tragedy in his life, usually like loss of his whole family, and then he deals with this emotional pain by just killing everything in sight, a la John Wick, a la, you know, Lethal Weapon, a la, like, I'm a sucker for the, the, the Punisher. I am a sucker for that genre. You could remake that story arc a thousand times, and I will be first in line in the, in the movie theaters. Batman right, he was a vampire to me, and I just it couldn't settle well. All right, so moving on, number four, is cereal a soup? Yes or no? No. No, it's not. Cereal, cereal is a cereal. It's in its own category. Is it though? But the principle. I mean, it's something in a broth. The broth just happens to be milk. <laughs> a I would also, even generalize that as a liquid. Also, you can you can eat cereal dry. You don't have to eat cereal with any sort of liquid. I mean, you can, but... I mean, you can really... eat Top Ramens without cooking them. <laughs> top Ramen? That's yeah, a good point. 
<laughs> you could just uh, Bob, I'm going to need that one added to the list. <laughs> All right, last uh, one. Finish the sentence. The Marketplace app I cannot live without is blank. The App Store. No, no, no. Uh, in in uh, Jira, which tool do you absolutely need? Oh, oh, oh. Which, which Marketplace app? Which Atlassian Marketplace app? And given your say do, I might be able to answer for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to, I can't, is it a cop out if I say Confluence just because it's my favorite? <laughs> yeah, we'll give it. To I you. mean, you're gonna make Andy happy. Confluence is my answer. Final answer. It is <laughs> my favorite. For, the- for all fairness, uh, the teams usually aren't exposed to the apps themselves. The end users don't usually know what app they're using. Yeah, but just know sometimes. that just, just know that we have agile velocity reports or something like that that's making your say do ratios actually be possible. Nice. <laughs> not, sponsored. Right, well, <laughs> not sponsored. All right, well, everybody, make sure you find us. We're gonna be at Team Twenty Four. Make sure you come pick up some stickers. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of different stickers, so uh, we are going to be. You all gotta the catch people. them all. Yeah, you gotta catch them all. We might do a little bingo. I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, so you're at, in Vegas in a few weeks. Make sure you find us. Um, I've already got a comment today that was basically some guys like, you guys are going to be way too busy. I'm going to not even approach you. Don't do that. No, nope. <laughs> no, we want no, you to we, approach us. We want by to all say means, hi. Yo, you see us, by all means, stop us. Say hi. We might even put you on camera. Uh, yeah, we're going to be recording a lot. So if you yeah, if you want your five seconds of shame, of shame, fame. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely fine. No, I think that's going to be me after um, that first panel I'm on. All right. We talked well, about you, the mistakes we made. Steve, thank you very much. Let me know when you want to do a part two or three on my channel, and we'll figure it out. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So, a little, a little shout out uh, for next week's guest. Uh, we are getting Philip Braddock um, from Atlassian. Yep. Yeah, from Atlassian, he is. He is he is the VC guy. He, you know, so if you are, yeah, he uh, makes the marketplace apps possible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely for all, for a lot of them. So it's going to be an interesting conversation on uh, about Atlassian from the uh, money side of things and entrepreneurship entrepreneurship side too. Yeah. Cool. Yep. All right, everybody. Thank all you. Right. See you next week. See ya. Thank you for listening to the Jira Life. Our hosts are Alex, Dr. Jira Ortiz, and Rodney, the Jira Guy, Nissen. You can find Alex on YouTube at Apetech Tech Tutorials, and Rodney's blog is found over at thejiraguy.com. Our producers are Robert King Bob Wen and Lena Ortiz. You can catch us live as we record this podcast every Thursday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern on YouTube at The Jira Life. Be sure to join us and our other Jira amigos of the Peanut Gallery every week to ask your questions, let us know your comments, and just tell us what you're up to. But if you can't join us live, you can still catch the replay over on YouTube. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and hit that bell while you're watching. We're also available as a podcast over on Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you listen to it and think it deserves a rating, we would very much appreciate it as it will help others discover the Jira life. Because we didn't choose the Jira life. The Jira life chose us.